I'm Matt Dickin, and this is Strategic Wealth. Here's what's coming up on today's show. When investors today are saying, geez, how long is this volatility going to last? And is there another big banger that we need to watch out for? Yeah, actually there are, and that's a good point, Mark, because if you were to look back at the 1930s, the stock market went That's just a little bit of what you're going to see right now. You know, Matt, one of the things we talk about a lot here are these uh, the trends in the market. And I think one of the most compelling ways that you get across to our listeners, in fact, I may back up for a moment, talk about what you do at your seminars. And you do a history of the stock market, and I think it's important for investors today to really take a look at what's transpired in the history of the stock market to understand what's happening right now. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Mark, you know, what most investors don't realize is that the stock market does run in certain predictable cycles. And although we can't predict the day that something might happen, we can certainly predict the cycle or the trend that we're in. So, you know, here in this country, we've had a stock market for about 115 years. So there's a lot of historical data. But uh, there are certain trends that over time, uh, you can kind of look back and see them. So, so, so let me go over a little bit of what I cover in the seminars, and that is talk a little bit about the history of the stock market, and then, of course, talk a little bit about what's going on here today. So if you were to go back, the first cycle or time period I want to cover is the years 1930 to the years 1948. Now, if you were to put money into the market in the year 1930, chances are it was 1948 before you got your money back. Okay, so we basically had 18 years with little to no growth. Most people don't realize that. Now, of course, as we look back at that time period, uh, that, that we now know that time period as the Great Depression. So for most investors, it was a bad time to be an investor. You know, Matt, let me ask you right now, and I know you're going to break the other trends out as well. Would you say that there are any similarities today to that time period? Can we draw any similarities? I mean, when investors today are saying, geez, how long is this volatility going to last? And is there another big banger that we need to watch out for? Can we draw any similarities? Yeah, actually there are. And that's a good point, Mark, because if you were to look back at the 1930s, the stock market went down in value by 30% or more eight different times. Okay, but on the flip side, it went up in value by 30% or more eight different times. Right. Okay, so it was all over the place. It was very difficult to get your arms around exactly what was happening. So uh, there are some similarities. We've seen that over the last 10 plus years here in this country. We've had several times where the market's lost a significant amount of money. Then it went back up just to go well, right well, Matt, back Well, Matt, for our again. investors out there listening, I hope we don't see that again anytime soon. I, I hope we Going don't Going up either. and down 30% in a particular year gets everybody yeah. on eggshells. I hope so too, Mark. But you know, if history is any indicator, you know that it does have a way of repeating itself. So if we take a look at the next cycle that happened, which was basically 1948 to 1966. Now, during this time period, we won the war. We came home, we celebrated, manufactured basically everything here in the United States. Like we do America. now, right? Yeah, not 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 not, we manufacture not necessarily now, right, right now, but you know, it was true back then. All of those things were good for the economy and investors. So from forty eight to sixty six, the stock market basically went up. There's some small, you know, sub cycles that happen along the way, but for the most part, it was a great time to be an investor. Now the next time period or the next cycle is nineteen sixty six to nineteen eighty two. And this is pretty interesting. Because during this time period, we had concerns over rising inflation. We had unstable interest rates, a lot of political unrest. There was a lot of political fighting, a couple of political scandals, uh, absolutely out of control oil and gas prices. And, of course, probably the biggest issue during this time was we were involved in a very unpopular war that we did not know how or when it was ever going to end. And we really didn't have any way of paying for it. Other than borrowing more money, or Matt, just, I gotta stop or just it for printing a more money. Are, are you talking about today? Are you talking no, about right now? I get now? that question a lot. Yeah, actually, I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about 1966 to 1982. It this, sounds a whole lot like today. This is what was happening. Now, that's that's a good point, Mark, because you know what happened to investors during this time period. This this was probably not a good time to be an right. investor. It was a bad time to be an investor. Chances are, if you put money in the market in the year 1966, chances are, it's 16 years later in 1982 before you got your money back. So again, we have another period where we have 16 to 18 years with little to no growth. 
All right. Now the next cycle or the next time period was the year two or was the year nineteen eighty two to the year two thousand. Ah. Uh, okay. Yes. So finally, friend. here we go. We've got an up market. Right. This is the greatest bull market we've ever seen. Okay, but I'm having a lot of people tell me that they really kind of feel like that those days are over, that those days you are know, behind Matt, are us. those, uh, could, could we possibly see, I mean, nobody has a crystal ball, but could we possibly see something like that, the, you know, 1982 to 2000? Could it happen mm-hmm. again? Uh, I think it could happen again, Mark, but I do not believe it's going to happen anytime soon. All right, we're in a completely different economic environment, a completely different political environment. I don't think we're going to see those types of returns again anytime soon. Are you trying to make our listeners cry? Is that what I'm, we're I'm trying not, to do today? I'm not. I, I kind of feel like those days are over. But, hey, at least it was kind of fun while it was it happening. It was good right? while it lasted. Okay? Absolutely. So great time to be an investor, of course, right? Now that kind of brings us up to this time period or this cycle, You know, pretty much the year 2000 to today. Now, when you take a look back at history, Individuals should be able to see the fact that our time period or this particular cycle is probably not over yet because these things usually take anywhere from 16 to 18 years to really work themselves out. You know, Matt, that's an important point. And I, I think a lot of investors, they take that short term, 12 month, 24 month, 36 month. But mm-hmm. but you really need to take a step back and look at these long term trends. Right. And, and obviously there are sub cycles in there. Right. But you have to take a look at this long term trend. as to, And so you could say to yourself, what should I be doing if the markets are going to remain volatile for till 2014, 15, 16, 17, right? right? I mean, well, it could be longer than that. You know, here, here's a few things that individuals need to be made aware of. You know, the stock market has gone through quite a few corrections. Over the last 10 years, we've seen two or three pretty significant corrections, but it's not unusual that the stock market goes down by a significant value. What most people don't realize, though, is that on average, it takes about seven years to recover from a stock market correction. So about seven years on average. Now, the longest it has ever taken is 18 years Mm. just to get back to even. Now, I would pretty much make the argument that if it takes you 18 years to get back to even, you don't really recover from that, do you? No, you don't recover from that. Okay, because you're 18 years older, you're maybe closer or, or into retirement at that point, your money will not buy what it would have bought. 18 years ago because of inflation and other Mm -hmm. factors. So that's not something that you really ever recover from. And we've seen that in the past. And really, if you look at it, Mark, we're about 11, 12 years into this particular cycle. And I know there's going to be some of our listeners here listening to us here this morning that have less money in their accounts today than what they had back in the year 2000 when this particular cycle started, Mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting because if you go back over these periods that we just covered, 1930 to 1948 was what? A bad time to be an investor. Right. It was followed by a good time, which was followed by a bad time, mm-hmm. which was followed by a good time. Right. So what's next? Well, Matt, the, the arrow would certainly be pointing downward. Right, which is the time period that we're in right now. So that's a little bit of you know historical information as far as why individuals are seeing little to no growth in their accounts over the last 10, uh, 11, 12 years. And unfortunately, it's something that could last even longer. The reason why it takes, on average, seven years to get back to even is because the stock market will go down, come up some, then go down again, come up some, and then do- go down again. So it takes a very long time to get back to even. If, if, if you lose 50% of your money in a stock market correction, and then the market goes up by 50%, you are not back to even. You know, Matt, and that's that's an interesting example. And I, why don't you explain that to everyone? Because you would think that a 50% return in the following year would bring you flush, but mm-hmm. that's not the case. No, it's real simple. Say you have $100,000 in an investment, and the stock market dro- drops by 50%, right? now. So now your account is only worth $50,000. Now, let's say the next year the market rallies and rebounds and goes up 50%. Well, your 50000 only becomes 75000 You don't get back to even. You actually need a 100% return to recover from a 50% drop. And that's why it takes seven years or 12 years or 18 years in order for individuals to get back to even. So that's why in our office, we take a safer money approach with our clients when they invest money with us. So, you know, how about I've got a good idea. Let's not lose the money in the first right. place. You know, you know, that way we don't have to wait 7, 10, 15, 18 years in order to get back to even. You know, uh, I, I recall in past radio shows you talking about two larger money managers in the country, uh, one our buddy at uh, Berkshire Hathaway mm-hmm. uh, and another money manager who really believed that the next five years, maybe even as long as the next decade, mm-hmm. could be flat. 
right. uh, at best. So um, what do you think about that? Well, actually, of course, you're, you're talking about Warren Buffett, mm-hmm. Berkshire Hathaway, and then Bill Gross, uh, who, who's the uh, basically the top investor at PEMCO. And both of them came out recently and said that they really believe that the stock market over the next 10 years is going to average about 2 to 3% returns, if we're lucky. You know, Bill if Gross. We're lucky. If we're lucky, Bill Gross said the best investors, the smartest investment minds over the next ten years, will probably average about four percent. Wow. Okay. Now, of course, neither of them have crystal balls, but they've done pretty well in the past. Their their opinions are very. I'd well say respected. they've done pretty they well. Pretty good track yeah, record, right? Absolutely. Now, Warren Buffett has a couple of great rules when it comes to picking an investment. All right. Rule number one is to never lose money. Mm-hmm. Do you know what rule number two is? Uh, refer to rule number one? Yeah, never forget rule number one. Okay, so I think in the times that we're in right now, if you go back and you, you kind of pay attention to this historical lesson that we've gone through here today, you know, now I think those two rules are probably a couple of important rules for individuals to be following. Hey, how do we get him on the show here? What do we got to do to get him on I the show? I don't know. Give him a call. Just give him see a call. You, call his see office. See you think he's join in? Us. Yeah. Uh, well, folks, you've been listening to The Matt Dickens Show, where safe money is smart money. without question one of the biggest areas of concern with our listeners and one of the biggest questions that gets a- emailed into us on a regular basis is I'm not sure the advisor I have right now is right for me where I am in my retirement cycle or I'm looking for an advisor I may not have one right now you have a lot of suggestions for our listeners on how to pick the right advice giver so why don't I throw it over to you so that you can uh, tell our listeners? Yeah, you know, that's a question that we've been getting here on the show for, for probably the, the, the two years that we've been running the, t- uh, the radio show. So what we did was earlier this year, we actually authored a report that individuals can contact our office and request, which is called How to Pick and Choose the Right Advice Givers. Because depending on the advisor that you work with, the information or the recommendations that you get might be very, very different from what it is that you really want or what you were expecting. So that can probably take a couple of minutes here, Mark, and go through a couple of our sections that we have in that kit. And again, anybody that would like a copy of the full kit, just contact the office and we're happy to send one out to them. You know, the first section that we have in the kit is, is something that's called a message about risk and reward. And this is talking about a lot of advisors that you talk with will probably recommend taking quite a bit of risk as you're close and into retirement. Of course, here on this show, we're advocates for not doing that. And one of the reasons why we don't like seeing individuals taking too much risk is because when you lose money, it's very hard to get ahead and stay ahead. It takes potentially a long time to recover when the stock market drops in value. And I'll give a couple of examples that are here in the kit. Let's say you lost 20% of your portfolio in any given year. You need a 25% return to recover from that. So and, that's, if, and that's to get back to zero, to, to even. Just to get to even, right. absolutely. So a lot of times people think, well, if the market goes down 20% and then up 20%, I'm even. That, unfortunately, is not how it works. Now, if you lose 30% of your portfolio, then you need almost 43% in returns just to get back to even. And of course, we're not taking into consideration taxes or fees. It gets even worse. If you lose 40% of your account value, which is really what happened to a lot of individuals back in 2008, then that means that you're going to need almost a 67% return just to recover from that and get back to even. And then the worst case scenario probably is that you lose 50% of your portfolio. Well, of course, if you lose 50%, you need a 100% return just to get back to even. You know, man, I think it's even more important than getting back to even. It's sleeping at night. It's, it's not worrying because if you are past the point of, of having an income, in other words, you don't work any longer, you have no way of taking advantage of the volatility in the market and buying shares at a lower price. You just have to sit and wait and hope. And I know for a lot of our listeners, we've gotten those calls. We've gotten those emails. They're distressed. 
mm-hmm. they are distressed. Right. Well, another great question I asked the advisor that either you're working with currently or maybe you're out interviewing is ask them who else works with them. What type of people come to them for their advice? You know, do they primarily work with individuals that are maybe younger looking for the hot IPO or stock of the week? Or are the majority of their clients just like you? If you're a retiree or soon to be retired, you want to work with an advisor that has a lot of experience in dealing with individuals in that situation. And that's where our firm, Strategic Wealth Designers, that's really what we focus on. Those that are retired or soon to be retired, meaning they're going to retire within about 10 years. That's the focus of our practice. And if you're in that uh, situation yourself, you want to make sure whatever advisor that you're working with uh, has the expertise that you need to move you through that so stage So you're telling your me if I want that hot stock, if I want to go crazy in the market, this mm-hmm. is not the firm. Right. Absolutely. Another section that we have in the kit is a quiz on your risk tolerance. Okay, and this is something that probably individuals have taken in years past. Some quizzes are five or ten questions. We have a little more in-depth quiz that we're happy to send anybody that uh, wants to request this particular report. So it'll take a look at how concerned are you about health care costs going up, are your wills and trusts in place? How comfortable are you with stock market volatility? It's, it's, it's not going to take an hour to take the quiz, but it's probably a more in-depth uh, quiz than what you may have taken in the past. You know, and I think there are a lot of variables that most investors don't take into account. They just think, I've got X amount of money. I need to make it last for so many years. Uh, but there are a lot of other things that need, you need to take into account. The estate planning end of it, the health care element of your retirement. And for a lot of folks, and we've talked about this on a lot of shows, some of those are big dollars, especially the health care side of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you just want to make sure that the advisor that you're talking to, you need to be comfortable with them, but you also have to make sure that they have the expertise that they need to guide you through this stage of your life. What other sort of things should investors be looking for in an advisor? Well, they need to have information or so, some knowledge on ways to reduce fees and expenses on your accounts, ways to minimize taxes. They need to know a little bit about wills and trusts. Now, most financial advisors are not attorneys, but they need to be able to know uh, enough to to at least be helpful. And then, of course, how to account for and plan for the long-term care that you might be needed either for yourself or maybe your spouse or significant other. You know, George Carlin has this joke that is, somewhere in the world is the worst doctor, but that's not the funny part. Someone has an appointment with him tomorrow. Right. Not unlike in the world of the financial services industry. There are those that are very, very good, and there are those that are not so good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really try to get across to our listeners, you need the people on the higher end of the spectrum. What sort of things should they look for in those people? Have they written books, uh, et cetera? Like, what sort of things? So I know when I go out there to put my money with someone, I'm with one of these high-end, really wonderful advisors. You want to see if they've authored books, other reports, maybe in magazines or newspapers. You want to see who asked them for advice, you know, what their clientele looks like, but also do other CPAs and attorneys seek them for their expertise? We have in the kit a whole list of questions that you should ask your current advisor or a potential advisor if you're looking to make a change. You know, we tell people, don't be shy. You need to know these things. This is your retirement. You've worked, and I think the stat is the average American will work 90,000 hours in their life. Man, oh man, you better get it right because what do you say? You only got one chance to get it right. Folks, you've been listening to The Matt Dickens Show on WKJK, where safe money is smart money. You know, Matt, there are a myriad of questions that we get from our listeners mailed in to us all the time, but a lot of people are looking for simplicity, uh, of some basic rules of thumb so they, compare, they can compare their portfolio against that to say, hey, in, in this economy, am I making the right decisions on things? Right. You talk about something 
called The Rule of 100. And you talk about it at your seminars, and I see people nodding their heads like, that makes sense. That right. is something that I need to at least look into. Uh, tell our listeners more about The Rule of 100. Okay, Mark. Th- this is a role that I think if investors had followed it over the last five to ten years, they probably wouldn't have done as, as bad with their portfolios as they may have potentially done. And I think over the next five to ten years, this is a great role to try and adhere to. Basically, what the rule of 100 says is whatever your age is, that's the percentage of your portfolio that should be in safer types of investments, okay? And then the difference between your age and the number 100 is the amount of money that you could put at risk if you're comfortable with putting your money at risk. It doesn't mean that you have to. It's just if you're comfortable with it. So somebody 60 years old should have 60% of their money safe. And then the difference between that, of course, is 40%. That's how much money they could have at risk in the market if they're comfortable with it. Somebody 70 years old, it should be a 70-30 breakdown. Now, we talk about this a lot on the show. And Mm -hmm. whenever we talk about it, I'll get emails or phone calls from individuals. And they'll say things like, I think the last gentleman said, well, Matt, I am 68 years old in only 65% of my money is safe, should I panic about that? Of course, no, no, you shouldn't panic about it. You don't have to hit the percentage exactly. You just basically want to be within the ballpark of this percentage, okay? So you don't have to hit it exactly, but you want to be pretty close to it, as close to it as you can get. Now, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take risk with the other 20, 30, 40, 50% of your portfolio, depending on your age, but that would be the maximum amount that you would want to take risk with. But I also want to talk a little bit about what safe means. Mm -hmm. You know, again, somebody 60 years old, 60% of their retirement nest egg should be safe. And what that means is that they won't lose any money at all, period. Okay, It doesn't mean that it's kind of safe or that it has less risk than the other 40% of their portfolio. What we're talking about is that you don't ever lose any money at all, regardless of what happens in the stock market. So that's 60% could consist of certainly money that you have on deposit in the bank, in money market accounts or CDs, uh, certainly some of the fixed or indexed annuities that are out there. That would qualify for your safe portion as long as you don't have more money than what the insured limits are. So, of course, the bank is covered by FDIC up to $250,000. So what you're talking about there is something that's guaranteed safe. You want to you have something that safe, cannot go safe. down in value. That is that – is, the definition of safe here, not if the market goes down 20%, you only lost 10%. Right. That that yeah. that, that That's doesn't really qualify safe. as a safe investment Correct. as far as this example is concerned. Right. So you have to be careful, and that's a good point, because we'll see things like mutual funds that'll have titles in them like conservative growth or conservative income uh, portfolio or things of that nature. If they're tied to the stock market, they are not safe. Okay. Of course, they might be less risky than having individual stocks or trying to pick the right IPO or something like that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're safe. Now, another thing that is not safe and that uh, 60% of the portfolio that should be secure for a 60-year-old is a diversified mutual fund portfolio. Mm -hmm. Any of those types of assets would fall into the at-risk category. So just because you're using multiple mutual funds doesn't guarantee that your money is safe. And and that's a good point because I know that different advisors have different ways that they view that term safety. When you look at the rule of 100, the safer money part of your portfolio should be completely safe, guaranteed, insured. You can't lose a penny no matter what. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but uh, a lot of advisors today are preaching that by virtue of diversification that your portfolio is safe. Mm -hmm. and maybe this is something that needs to be uh, re-looked at. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if in fact, okay, I'm 65 years old and 65% or thereabouts should be in a safe environment, just because I'm diversified in my portfolio does not mean that I've achieved safety. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. If we go back and take a look at 2008, it probably didn't matter whether you had four different mutual funds or eight or 15 you know, chances are all of them went down in value. So anytime that you have any type of investment, a mutual fund, a variable annuity, a stock portfolio, anything that's tied to the to the stock market in general, 
would fall into that risk category just because you own multiple mutual funds or multiple stocks or blue chip companies, things like that, doesn't necessarily mean that the money is safe. You know, uh, we, we've talked about this uh, a lot of times on, on various shows, and there are a couple questions that pop up. And one is bonds. Uh, would would my bonds fit into that safety category? And I, I know you, there's... There's a few things that people need to look out for, Matt. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a little bit of a gray area because it depends on the bond that you have. Okay, so some bonds like uh, U.S. Treasuries, government-backed bonds, are going to be completely safe. Okay, so you could use those in that, uh, in that percentage of your portfolio that's not at risk. But however, if we're talking about a corporate bond, well, of course, that's not necessarily safe. I would agree it's less risky than owning the individual stock because mm -hmm. bonds have less volatility. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that the money is safe. And another area that we get questions a, uh, about a lot is gold and silver, other commodities. Man, it's all over TV. Some Every time it's TV uh, put it radio. in gold, uh, hedge against inflation. Right. What individuals have to understand is that when they talk about gold and the run-up in price, they always focus pretty much on the last five years. And I'll agree, the last five years have been pretty attractive. Nice time for gold, absolutely. If you take a look at the last 20 years— Basically, a CD at the bank would have outperformed gold. Wow. So basically what happened is gold has dropped by 20% or more in value before, and we've seen periods of 18 to 20 years where gold hasn't gone up in value whatsoever. Wow. So gold, again, would not necessarily qualify as part of the safer money that you should have in your portfolio. It's just too volatile over time. The last five years look really good. But it could be one of those situations where you're the last one to arrive at the party. Folks, keep those questions coming. We just love them. Go to AskMattDickon.com. You've been listening to The Matt Dickon Show, where safe money is smart money. Come see Matt live and discover what millions of safety-conscious Americans are doing now to protect and preserve their assets and make up for market losses. Will recent legislation changes affect your retirement? Can you safeguard your assets from unnecessary taxation? Can you find growth and security without risk in today's volatile market? Due to overwhelming demand for these events and very limited seating, we recommend that you call today, 855-MATT-DICKON. That's 855-MATT-DICKON or go to askmattdicken.com.